Please remain standing for the reading of God's word, which comes to us from the gospel according to Mark in the third chapter, verses 28 through 35. Listen now to the word of God. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, open our ears and our eyes to illumining your grace. Lord, we are in need of a clearer focus so we can see the work of your salvation in us. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, last week we started an encounter between Jesus and both his family and scribes from Jerusalem. Today we are closing out that conversation. So last we left Jesus, he was defending his ministry with logic and decrying any collusion with the devil. You remember the scribes and the Pharisees accused him of being in league with Satan. And so today we pick up with the scribes and then move back to Jesus's family. So for today, I want you to enter into my thought process uh, as I go through and work on uh, these sermons and these messages, I sometimes will uh, ask myself a series of questions. And I wanted to uh, bring you all into this same process with me. And so six questions arose during my study. So I want us to walk through them today. First, where did this talk of forgiveness come from? From plundering Satan's house, Jesus jumps to all sins shall be forgiven. It seems like a, a strange leap, but we cannot skip over the intro to verse 28, which should be applied not just to our passage, but belongs to the whole conversation. Truly, I say to you. That's the intro there. When Jesus says this phrase, this is a formula of truthfulness and authority. Essentially, what Jesus is telling us, what follows is authoritative. It is not up for debate. What I am about to say is solid, absolute truth. You either ascribe to it or you do not. There is no moral ambiguity. And so this is what follows. All sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. Eugene Peterson, a, a translator of the message, he, he, says, he says it this way. There's nothing done or said that can't be forgiven. I think that's a good translation, a beautiful, understandable translation. God willingly and graciously forgives the sins and blasphemies of repentant sinners. And that's a key word in there, repentant sinners. The only forgiveness that is offered are to those who truly want to turn away from their sin. Those who wish to truly live as transformed human beings. Only they Will receive forgiveness. If you are not repentant of your sins, if you love living in your sin, or you think your sin is right and that you're free to do it, you will not receive forgiveness. But when you sin, 
And if you are truly repentant of that sin, God will forgive. King David, he committed adultery. He committed murder. And yet even those were not beyond redemption. St. Peter thrice denied Jesus before others. Yet even his blasphemy was redeemed. John 3, 16, we know that verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We cannot separate Christ from the forgiveness he offers to repentant sinners. Grace, the grace of forgiveness is known fully in Christ. We can never truly know forgiveness if we do not know Christ. He, being the incarnate God, bore our hostility and our punishment to share with his children his redemptive love. And so forgiveness is always in relationship to someone else. Just think about uh, the forgiveness that you might offer to someone who has hurt you. It's always in relationship. You can never offer forgiveness in a bubble or individually to yourself. There's always a relationship there. And so it's a package deal. No one can reject forgiveness without also rejecting God, the author and giver of forgiveness. And so this leads me to my second question. How does Jesus then define blasphemy? He says, but whoever blaspheme against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And I ask that because as I noticed before, as I said, we use the example of St. Peter, three times he refused Jesus. He said, I don't know that man. That's a blasphemy, isn't it? So how then is Jesus defining it? Well, Calvin says that blasphemy cannot be extended indiscriminately to every sort of crime. So Jesus sees blasphemy as something very specific. And so as I illustrated before, David committed adultery and murder. Peter lied. And so blasphemy then is a very specific sin that's not one of those or, or perhaps any of the other of the Ten Commandments. So to understand Jesus' authoritative teaching, we must have an understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit. Because he says specifically, this is a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So what, is, what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, John chapter 3, verses 5 through 6, really, uh, John chapter 3 is such a wonderful exposition on pneumatology, the work of the Spirit, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. There, Jesus tells Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, remember the authoritative formula? that we just talked about. Here he says again, and so in John chapter three, truly, truly, I say to you, what I'm about to tell you is authoritative. It is final. It is true truth. It is absolute truth. Unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. This whole chapter is talking about regeneration, being made born anew, being uh, born again, this regenerated, being made into a new person. And that is done through the Spirit. That is a work of the Holy Spirit. The transformation that the gospel brings into a person's life, that is the work of the Holy Spirit. And so the Christian, the born-again Christian, the regenerate Christian, lives through the Spirit. Before he enters into our heart, before the Spirit comes and turns our heart of stone into a heart of flesh, we've been living through sin. Without the Spirit, we continue to live in sin. And so the Spirit, before the Spirit touches a person, the sins that he or she commits are held against him or her only insofar as that person is ignorant of God's grace. He or she is still guilty of sin. Don't hear me wrong. But when the Spirit enters in and regenerates 
that person. The forgiveness of Christ is applied on their life. And he or she is given a clean slate. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Wipes our slate clean. What God, when God looks at a sinner, he sees the corruption, he sees the pollution that sin has wrought in the life. But when he looks upon a regenerate person, when he looks upon a believer, a person who is born again in Christ, he sees what the Holy Spirit has done, wiped away that dirt and grime. However, those who rebel after the power of God has been revealed, they cannot be excused of the plea of ignorance. That's Calvin's warning for us. And that's the point Jesus is making here about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. He's talking about apostates, apostasy. And so Mark helps us to get to this understanding by adding, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So the they here is talking about the Pharisees. The Pharisees deliberately rejected that which they knew to be God. If they were truly true biblical scholars, they would have known exactly who Jesus is. So one of two things happened. One, either they weren't really biblical scholars and they didn't know the truth. Or two, they knew the truth, recognized who Jesus was, and still rejected him. Everything Jesus said and did, they ought to have recognized as from on high. But because they could not deny the reality of what the Holy Spirit had done through Christ, they preferred to attribute it to Satan, a work that they knew was from God. You see, the Spirit enlightens and illuminates. The Spirit brings to life the good news of the gospel. To blaspheme against him is first to hear and receive his gifts and powers. So blaspheme is to turn against. So we, you clearly would have heard the gospel message and understood the gospel message, but then to turn around and slap the spirit in his face. That is blasphemy. And so this raised a third question for me. Are there different levels of sin? Christ here is drawing a distinction between two degrees. And so we look at the previous encounters for clarification. Jesus' kinfolk charge him with being out of his mind. They say he's crazy, that he's gone mad. The Pharisees charge him with being in league with the devil. He is excited with iniquity himself. Both of these charges are sins, but one is more grievous than the other. The charge of insanity comes from folks who know Jesus as a family member, as a person, as a human being, as, as another man, but they didn't know him as the Redeemer. At this point in Jesus' ministry, the common folk don't know the messianic secret. He's been keeping it under wraps, remember? The charge of demon possession comes from folks who see Jesus' authority. They know the scriptures. They know what he's talking about, but they refuse to acknowledge it in him. And so the teachers of the law know what Jesus represents. He represents a challenge to their authority. And so the sin of pride wells up within them and they blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Sins committed against a triune God by unbelievers are forgivable. Indeed, that is the entire premise of the gospel message. If sins could not and would not be forgiven, then there's no point in preaching the gospel. But sins committed against the triune God by so-called believers, so-called because they have the revelation of gospel illumination. They've sat in church, sat under preaching and teaching and Bible study. And they even claim to be believers. But those sins against 
God, the author of salvation, is unforgivable. So here's what I mean. Christians and churches who take the revelation of the gospel and purposefully pervert it and knowingly practice against it, they are committing blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what the Pharisees were doing. They knew the message. They heard and understood the message, and yet they continued to pervert it and to practice against it. To sin in ignorance, to make claims about God in ignorance, that's one thing. But to twist and to pervert and to subvert the word of God is to slap in the face the author of that word. Sin is sin is sin. There are not levels of sinning. There are, however, differences between sins committed in ignorance and sins openly and intentionally committed in the light of Christ. No one can call himself a regenerate Christian and continue to swim in the mire of sinful living. That is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Making mistakes and missing the mark, that's different. For we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But that is different from the desire and intentionality of living a lifestyle that is absolutely abhorrent to God. And so at this point, Mark transitions back to Jesus' kinfolk by introducing his mother and brothers as standing outside, and they sent to him and called him in. So this brought to mind a fourth question. Does Jesus break the fifth commandment? To answer this question, we must first find out why Jesus responded, who are my mother and my brothers? Mary and her other sons were likely part of the big crowd that joined at Peter's house, possibly after hearing about Jesus' work on the Sabbath. The placement of this episode in all the gospel account reveals that Mary is likely trying to stop Jesus from arguing with the Pharisees. She's a good mother, and as a good Jew, she likely respected the Pharisees' authority. And if her son is going around condemning uh, calling out these Pharisees, the leaders of the church, the uh, seminarian, the seminary professors, she's got to step in and do something. Something must have happened. I don't know what my son could be doing. And so she wishes to intervene. So imagine the scene like this. Jesus' meal is suddenly interrupted by his kinsfolk who try to seize him, claiming that he's gone mad. The Pharisees interrupt their departure by claiming Jesus is in league with the devil. And so this causes Jesus to rebuke them. His chastisement of the top brass, the seminary professors, whom everyone looks up to, caused Mary to then interrupt him. And so Jesus' words are quite shocking, perhaps even offensive. But they are strong only because he wishes to reprove his mother's eagerness. We are not in the cult of Mary like the Catholics, but we cannot downplay her importance and neither her humility. Remember, God chose her to bear his son. She would not very quickly forget that. But she is human, just like you and I. And she can be emotional, just like you and I. Calvin says it was foolish of her to wish to break off his discourse in this manner while he was teaching. So you see, Jesus never breaks the fifth commandment or any commandment because his actions are never malicious. In fact, Jesus' point and purpose is to bring his mother and family back to reconciliation. You see, Jesus oftentimes utilizes shocking, challenging, or even scandalous words and actions to prove his authority and to reprove 
And so this brought me to a fifth question. Does Jesus mean that family ties are unimportant? Now, this is one of the hardest questions to answer, and one that I believe was hard ever since the New Testament was written. On multiple occasions, Jesus makes it plain and clear what his views on family ties are. There is no tie of relationship more sacred than spiritual relationship, asserts Calvin. Because we ought not to think of Christ according to the flesh, but according to the power of his spirit, which he has received from the Father to renew men to be heavenly sons of God. True Christian discipleship involves a spiritual relationship that transcends the physical family. Moreover, it is open to all who are empowered by the Spirit of God to come to Christ in repentance and faith. So really, it's a wider circle. It's a more inclusive organization than just the family. Through the Spirit and with the help of of brothers and sisters in faith, believers are enabled to live a life of obedience to God's word. Everyone who is regenerated by, by the Spirit gives himself up entirely to God for true justification. This is Calvin's words again. And thus, that person is admitted to the closest union with Christ, becoming one with him. And so this leads to a perfect, wonderful illustration that I think we can understand, the illustration of marriage. There we see uh, two loved ones leaving their parents' house to then form a new one. The church leaves the house of the world to live in the house of the Lord. That's what happens when we wed ourselves to Jesus Christ. Are we to abandon our family then? By no means. We are blessed even more when our blood relatives are also our spiritual relatives. And when our relatives are unbelievers, we are not to distance ourselves from them, but rather continue to share the light of Christ with them hopes in the hopes that the Holy Spirit will open their eyes. Husbands are still to love their wives. Wives are still to honor their husbands. And children are still to obey their parents. So long as these family ties do not come between us, and doing the will of God, they are to be loved and commended. But if family ties, if familial relationships try to divide our relationship with God, if my family tries to divide my relationship with Christ, then something needs to happen that I need to remain firm in my faith and do whatever possible to correct those wayward family members. Now, this brings me to my final question. Is Jesus then basing salvation on good works? The simple answer is no. When Jesus says, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. He is not saying one earns salvation. Many times throughout Jesus' ministry, he asserts that the root or the heart of a person is revealed in its fruit, in his fruit. Good fruit is born by good trees, but bad fruit is born out of bad trees. Obedience to God is not a prerequisite of salvation. It never is. One can't be obedient to a rule that you are unaware of. They're still guilty for breaking the rule, but we cannot expect them to be obedient. Think of the example of, of a speed limit sign. If you're driving down Wards Road 29 or anywhere 
and you know that the speed limit is 65. So you're going 65. But you enter into a zone that suddenly the speed limit lowers down to say 45. If there's no sign there for whatever reason, or you miss the sign for whatever reason, you are still guilty of speeding. And so municipalities put up these signs, speed limit signs, to inform you of when you are speeding or of when you need to change your speed limit. And so we obey the speed limit law, not because it's going to save us, but because we know it. Because we know what the law is, now we can follow it. God has revealed to us his will, his ordinances, his commandments in Christ. And because we love Christ, because we are born again in Christ, because he has saved us, we lovingly, willingly, submit ourselves to him and obey his commands. The introduction of Christ, you know, the speed limit sign, and the regeneration of the spirit, which is recognizing the signage, they are the first steps to salvation. And once a person is born anew in Christ, then obedience becomes a must. If a regenerate Christian does not love to obey God, then it's clear from our earlier conversation that that person is blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Therefore, obedience does not lead to salvation. Obedience is not a prerequisite to salvation, but rather obedience is a signifier of salvation. It is a fruit of our regeneration. So that brings us back. Who are Jesus's true kinfolks? Well, why? It is those who are born of the Spirit and not of the flesh. Those who are adopted into his household. Who blasphemes the Holy Spirit then? Those who know the commands and still refuse to obey. And so, church, I invite you to pray with me as you find yourself within the schema. Are you outside wanting to get inside? Are you inside wanting to live outside? So I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Holy God, I ask that you open our eyes to our daily sins. Lord, we do sin against you. And so, Lord, I ask for your illumination to show us the ways that we sin so that we can seek your forgiveness because, Lord, you love us. You love your children. And you discipline us when we go wrong. And you, you bring us back into reconciliation when we come to you in repentance. So open our ears to the apostasy of present day Pharisees. Lord, they are all around us. They are in our denomination. They are within this community. Lord, these Pharisees distort the truth and they delight in sin. Help us to guard our hearts from such love of sinning. Lord, it's so easy to fall into the temptation of a lifestyle of sinfulness but we fail to recognize that that lifestyle is abhorrent to you. Help us bear the fruit of the righteousness of Christ in ourselves, in our lives, in our families, and in our churches. Lord, we know that we have been grafted onto the vine. We abide with Christ. And so when we are with him, when we are united unto him. Lord, we must bear the fruit of that union. Lord, we ask 
Would you transform our hearts of stone to be hearts of flesh, where your word can be planted and take root and grow and produce fruit of obedience to your commands. Lord, we pray all this in the precious name of our Savior, Jesus Christ.